mentioned earlier, you're welcome to go on back, even if, well, I guess if you're tired of my preaching. So uh, I guess Todd's back there. We've got several go back. Okay, good. <laughs> There's Todd, because I caught him going back there. Amen. Brother, you ready? Yeah, you ready? Let's go. All right. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for Gary in our midst and the gift of Gary. And I pray that you bless his heart, bless his mind as he shares, shares his heart with us and shares your words. Pray that you bless our hearts to receive. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, David. Good morning, everyone. Happy to see you here. Happy to see our guests uh, with us today. One, one thing about the Destin Church, we have guests every single week of the year. And that is always such a great thing to see uh, because I've been in churches before where months and months and months might go by and, uh, and, and there's no guests. Here every single week. It's always good to see uh, new people, some returning, coming down here on vacation or whatever for a few weeks or um, maybe a few months. So glad to have you here with us today. So last week, last week I uh, preached for you, and uh, as, as I do most weeks, I guess. And uh, last week's sermon was like 20 minutes long. Didn't know if y'all noticed that. One person mentioned as they were leaving that uh, they didn't get quite as much sleep. And I said, well, I'm sorry. Uh, no, they uh, mentioned it was a little shorter. I didn't pay it much attention, and I looked on YouTube and saw it was like 20 minutes. And I think that's the shortest sermon I've ever done in my life. It was like a sermonette. And um, this week you're getting your money's worth. Because I figure I'll add on the time I didn't use last week. But, uh, <laughs> so last week, some of you knew, I was kind of, I was a little sick last week. Probably shouldn't have been preaching, and uh, I think I had the flu, actually. But um, our elders encourage us, if you're feeling sick, don't come to worship. And uh, a couple of them had asked me if I was okay. I said, sure, and maybe I lied. Uh, but I was feeling kind of just worn out, mainly you've ever had the flu so so last week wow 20 minutes so this week I'm feeling great <laughs> I am feeling so good and so sometimes in here I have to be careful to make sure I don't go too long because our Bible classes are afterwards our Bible classes will start at 10 30 and sometimes the Bible class teacher kind of gives me a funny look that, you know, you're going into overtime, preacher, because then I start infringing on their class. So I talked with the Bible class teacher today and told that clown, look, <laughs> I'm going long today. And... I'm teaching the Bible class this morning, actually, so, so it was a conversation with myself. I just did that as a segue. Let you know, this week we were supposed to do a class, a Bible class on prayer as we're getting ready for our elder selection process coming up in January. Um, elders want to have another class on prayer, just one class, individual class, Adam Dunaway is going to do. Adam is out this week with the flu. <laughs> I don't chuckle mainly. Hopefully, I did not give him the flu this past week, but uh, he's much better uh, now, but decided not to come and give everyone else the flu. So I was going to start my Bible class, The Empowering Words of Jesus, uh, after his. So he got with me this past week, said, hey, can we swap? So this week, our first lesson on The Empowering Words of Jesus in our Bible class Next week, he will have a class on prayer. The following week is Christmas Day, and we're not going to have class. Then I'll pick back up the first Sunday of January uh, with my class on the empowering words of Jesus to take us through February. Did you get all of that? Yes, that's on the test. So today, we continue our study of, of the heart of Christmas, 
and we're going to be looking at the gift of, of joy today. And I want to talk about joy for a couple of reasons. One, because it's most definitely one of the gifts of Christmas. Uh, Luke records the following words uh, in the second chapter of his gospel that Jim read for us this morning. And, 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 and basically, just to shorten it here, is I bring you good news of great joy in Luke chapter 2 right there. And so we know this verse by heart, I'm sure. Certain verses in the Bible we have memorized, whether we know it or not. This is one of them. But I want us to look, 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 look at this a little bit differently this morning. I don't oftentimes, and you've heard me say this before, bring up Greek words. Because most of the time, people, I don't think, really care. And yes, I did have to take Greek years ago. I am not a Greek scholar, but this one was interesting. The Greek word... For great, the Greek word is megos, megos, where we get our word mega, mega. Now, the good news angels proclaim wasn't just good news of joy, it was good news of mega joy. Now see, mega in our minds should be bigger than great. Is it great? No, man, it is mega. We know this verse. Do we really comprehend what it's saying? I'm talking mega joy. Mega joy for all people, for, for, for you, for me. Mega joy. Yeah. And the second reason I want to talk about joy is because, well, let, let me tell you what. Oftentimes, Christmas is not a joyful time for people. We sing our songs, Joy to the World. Oh, come all ye faithful, joyful and triumphant. We sing, Repeat the sounding joy. But real joy oftentimes eludes so many. And I'm sure that, that that's not news to you. We've heard the stories of how Christmas season can be a time of great depression for many. People feel bad. People feel sad during this time of year. This might be your first Christmas without a loved one. It might be your first Christmas after a, a breakup or divorce. It might be your first Christmas after... I'm mindful of those things. And I wish I had the magic words that would make it easier, but I don't. But maybe Jesus will here in a minute. You see, we, we want to be, I think most of us want to be joyful during this time of year. I told my story, I'm going to quickly repeat it. Uh, Christmas 2006, I was in Iraq at the, our hospital there at Balad Air Base. And... Um, like I said, many of you have heard this story where we had a soldier who was going to die and there was nothing that could be done for him. He was on life support. And um, the, the, um, he had no brain activity, so you can't just, there's certain laws and things that govern, you can't just leave somebody on life support if there's no brain activity. And so the, the bad thing was, it was Christmas. It was like Christmas Eve, Christmas Day. We were in Iraq. Uh, once someone, once a soldier dies, um, they immediately send for uh, the next kin notification. We want to get there quickly. And so the, they called together, uh, and I forgot what it w was called, but I was on it. I was a chaplain there in the hospital. Once again, our hospital was a series of tents set up, something like you'd see on MASH, and was asked, uh, 
it was myself, the medical doctors, different ones, uh, a discussion on when to pull life support. And there was a very intense argument going on because if they pulled life support, his death would have been on Christmas Day. Um, and so I was there as the, the religious, the spiritual part of that. It's not a medical review board. I can't recall what, the, what it's called, but the chaplain always sits on that with him. And, and we, we were having this discussion and um, the interesting thing was one of the doctors who was fighting so hard to keep him on life support till after Christmas was a Jew, a, a practicing Jew, who Christmas was not his holiday. Hanukkah was. And what, what I loved about him so much was in his mind, in his heart, he didn't want this Christian soldier family to be notified on Christmas Day of his death. And so there was a lot of discussion going on right then. When is this going to happen? Because the notification team is going to have to go out and is the, do is the door going to knock on Christmas Day? Do we want to wait till the day after Christmas? Um, and and it, was, it was because we didn't want to mess up their holiday. We didn't want to mess up their holiday. I think about them every year. I think about this soldier's wife. I think about this soldier's children every year. Because the Christmas 2006 was not good. The ultimate decision was, uh, because you're probably wondering, they, they finally had asked me, I said, you know what, it's, it's, it's not going to matter. Even if, if they're notified December 26th, they will remember the Christmas holiday as the death of Dad. And yeah, I'm sure they would. So to many... This holiday isn't joyful in many of our senses of, of the way that, that we look at life. But, but look, I want us to look at things a little different this morning. I, I, want us to, I want us to have that mega joy even if this is not your favorite time of year. Maybe it's not your favorite time of year because you get so busy you can't even enjoy this time of year. So, this morning, we're going to look at the Grinch. <laughs> yes, we're familiar with the Grinch. You might say, well, I live with one. <laughs> Don't name names. And it's actually going to be an acrostic of Grinch. And the first one here is give your worries to God. That's so simple. That's your sermon. Give your worries to God. Wow, preacher, thank you. I am absolutely the most wise man in here because I've just helped you all out. Give your worries to God. I had a sermon on this not long ago. Did we do that? Do we take our, our yoke off of us as we go into the prayer closet, give it all to God, and then we come out, we put it all back on? Give our worries to God. Do people ever worry during the Christmas season? Well, Sure. People ever get anxious during this time of year? You know, what am I going to buy for so-and-so? How, how am I going to pay for all this? What, what, what if they buy me a present and I didn't get them one? Uh, is my weird uncle going to act up this year? Will I ever find a parking place at the mall? What am I going to preach next year? Yeah, I guess that one's kind of to me worries get closing out one year looking at another and i'll tell you right now worries one of the main reasons people lose their joy not only during the christmas season but 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 all, all year long it's hard to be joyful when you're stressed out so cory ten boom said well she did say something 
Um, Corey Ten Boom says, uh, does not em- worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. There it is. And then uh, Mickey Rivers, at the time an out- outfielder for Texas Rangers, stated this philosophy of life. He says, ain't no sense worrying about the things you got control over. Because if you got control over them, ain't no sense worrying. Ain't no sense worrying about things you got no control over. Because if you got no control over them, ain't no sense worrying. That really makes so much sense. Summed up right there. So, let's see what Jesus says. In Matthew chapter 6, 25 through 27. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you'll eat or drink, about your body, what you'll wear. Is not life more than food, the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air, they do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more valuable than they? Can any one of you by worrying add a single hour to your life? Jesus says, you know what? Your Father knows what you need. I, I, I sometimes think that if we really understand, if we really understand, truly understand, and really believe that we're a child of God, it will take away the worries of the world. I got to thinking about this, and I realized, you know what? My children, as they were growing up, I don't think they worried about whether or not they were going to have a home to live in or food to eat or clothes to wear and they didn't worry about if there'd be heat in the winter and AC in the summer or water for a shower or soap for a bath. I don't think they worried about those stuff or worried about those things because you know they knew that we were aware of those needs and they trust us to take care of them. And then Really, if we're honest, most of us would have to admit that most of us trust God less than our own children trust us. Hmm. Giving your worries to God. Giving your worries to God. The R here. Refuse to focus on what you don't have. Don't focus on what you don't have. Solomon writes in the uh, 14th uh, proverb, verse 30, A heart at peace gives life to the body, but envy rots the bones. Envy. 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 People often struggle with envy during Christmas season. You know, I, I, I wish I had more money to buy gifts. I wish we could... Go away on vacation like the Joneses do. Or, you know, if I live in a house like that, I'd be happy too. Or whatever it is. And envy comes along. Envy. So why did the Grinch think that he'd stolen Christmas for the Who's? Because he thought he'd taken away everything that that Christmas was about. He thought this was the final note in his symphony of nastiness. And that's why when the Grinch heard coming from Whoville, not sounds of sadness, but joy, he was perplexed and wondering, what, what's going on? It, it came without ribbons, it came without tags, it came without packages, boxes or bags. Oh, I make an assumption that all of us know the story of the Grinch, correct? Or any of you like, I have never heard of this guy. If you haven't, get with me afterwards. The reason the Grinch couldn't take away the Who's Christmas was because the Who's refused to focus on what they didn't have. They took it all away. And they were still joyful people. You know, we're not always going to be able to give or receive what we want or 
our families are not always perfect. At times, loved ones, well, loved ones leave us to go home to be with the Lord. But those things should not affect our joy. Preacher, how can you say that? Well, I can say it because the Bible teaches that. It should not affect our joy. If we refuse to focus on what we don't have, it'll keep our joy, not just at Christmas, but every day of the year. The I include time for rest. Job 9.25 describes the life of many this year. Some of you, this will probably be the first time you've ever seen this verse. My days are swifter than a runner. They fly away without a glimpse of joy. You got to remember, um, Job's feeling kind of bad right about this time. People do a lot of running around this year. Malls to con conquer, right? That Amazon wish list. Which, if you'd like mine, let me know. I'll email it to you. Just kidding. Presents to buy, traffic to battle, programs to attend, food to prepare, cards to send, trees to trim, decorations to hang, parties to go to. All of these things. It's all coming together right now. And then we get behind. Okay, so I'm going to cure this getting behind thing right now. Here it is. Y'all are going to be like, man, you're the wisest man I've ever met in my life. Okay. Here it is. In 2023, Christmas will be December 25th. <laughs> Prepare now. <laughs> wow, preacher. <laughs> You're the greatest. Yeah. Isn't that easy? Go ahead and start getting ready now. Why put the decorations away? You know it's coming right back. <laughs> Rest. Rest is important. Rest is so important that you know, God used himself as an example. He created a world, took six days, seventh he rested. Was he tired? No, I don't think God gets tired. Um, I think he modeled an important aspect and principle of life. We need a scheduled time of rest. So church, let me tell you, we need to learn to say no to some things. We do. We do. We have people we love, people we want to be around, and we need to do what we can. But you know what? Um, I think it was Nancy Reagan who coined the phrase, just say no. And sometimes we have to say no for our own sake. In. Never forget the reason. One of these live shows again. So Luke chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. The angel said to him, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah. He's the Lord. Wow. Season of Christmas. You know what? We needed a Savior. We needed a Savior. The reason for the season, well, that's God's gift to all of us. The Christ child didn't come 2,000 years ago so that we give each other presents. That wasn't his, his main reason. Or to decorate our houses, drink eggnog, have parties, sit on Santa's lap. No, no, Christ came. This little baby was born to a virgin, laid in a manger for one reason. You know what? Jesus was born to die. He was born. He was born to die. That's the reason. Christmas is about God giving His Son to die for all of us. So we're going to jump down to the letter N in Grinch. We'll come back to the C because I want to close with that one. Jump down to letter H. Did I say jump down to letter N? I meant H. 
The H in the word Grinch stands for hold your thoughts captive. Paul writes in uh, 2 Corinthians 10 verse 5, Take captive every thought. If you don't hold your thoughts captive, there's a good chance you'll lose your joy this Christmas season. This is, church is about controlling, controlling our thinking. If you start thinking negative things during this time of year, think about what you want but you don't have, you start worrying about this and you start worrying about that. If you start thinking depressed thoughts, let me tell you what, if you start going down that road and you're thinking depressing thoughts, negative thinking, or as it's sometimes called stinking thinking, you are going to feel bad. Okay? You're like, wow, man, preacher, where do you just keep coming up with all of this wisdom? I just got it, man. Negative thinking will affect your life. Stop it. Stop it. I woke up one night a week or so ago, and I had all this negative thinking going on. It was 3 a.m., and I woke up, startled awake, and it was instant negative thinking. I'll tell you what it was about. Was my boat going to start in the spring? <laughs> Did I put any fuel stabilizer in the fuel tank? Yeah, that's what I was thinking. And I'm lying there in bed, worried, thinking this very negative thought that I will have a jacked up boat come spring. So what I do? I say I had to change that thinking. Buy a new boat. <laughs> and I had a good night's rest. Control your thinking. Take captive your thoughts. Don't allow those negative thoughts in. If you're wondering what to think about, then Paul offers some great advice. Philippians chapter uh, 4, verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever's true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything's excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Read that, church. Think about the positive things of life, not the negative things, the things that are good, true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. Think about those things. Lastly, consider your future. So let me read something for you. This comes from Max Lucado, his book, A Love Worth giving. This is reading from the book. No man had more reason to be miserable than this one, yet no man was more joyful. His first home was a palace. Servants were at his fingertips. The snap of his fingers changed the course of history. His name was known and loved. He had everything, wealth, power, respect, and then he had nothing. Students of the event still ponder it. Historians stumble as they attempt to explain it. How could a king lose everything in one instant? One moment he was royalty, the next moment he was in poverty. His bed became at best a borrowed pallet, and usually it was a hard earth. He never owned even the most basic mode of transportation and was dependent upon handouts for his income. He was sometimes so hungry he would eat raw grain or pick fruit off a tree. He knew what it was like to be rained on, to be cold. He knew what it meant to have no home. His palace grounds had been spotless. Now he was exposed to filth. He'd never known disease. He was now surrounded by illness. In his kingdom he had been revered. Now he was ridiculed. His neighbors tried to lynch him. 
Some called him a lunatic. His family tried to confine him to their house. Those who didn't ridicule him tried to use him. They wanted favors. They wanted tricks. He was a novelty. They wanted to be seen with him. That is, until being seen with him was out of fashion. Then they wanted to kill him. He was accused of a crime he never committed. Witnesses were hired to lie. The jury was rigged. No lawyer was assigned to his defense. A judge, swayed by politics, handed down the death penalty. They killed him. He left as he came, penniless. He was buried in a borrowed grave, his funeral financed by compassionate friends. Though he once had everything, he died with nothing. He should have been miserable. Should have been miserable. He should have been bitter. He had every right to be a pot of boiling anger, but he didn't. He was joyful. He was joyful when he was poor. He was joyful when he was abandoned. He was joyful when he was betrayed. He was even joyful as he hung on a tool of torture, his hands pierced with six-inch Roman spikes. Jesus embodied a stubborn joy, a joy that refused to bend in the wind of hard times, a joy that held its ground against pain. That was Jesus. He was joyful. How was he able to maintain that joy? Well, I tell you what, Hebrews chapter 12 and verse 2 For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. You know, one of the reasons Jesus was able to live a life of joy was because of the future that he knew was set before him. Church, it's the same future we have set before us. A joy like no other. Joy to the world. Mega joy. Mega joy. We have a Lord who loves us and forgives us. And even if we stumble and even if we mess up and even if life isn't good and even if we're angry, no matter what, we have a God who loves us so much. He gave his son to die for all of us. A son who joyfully went to the cross. Wow. I want to encourage you. Give your worries to God. Don't focus on what you don't have. Include time for rest. Don't forget the reason for the season. Consider your future and hold your thoughts captive. Just some thoughts there that I have. Church, this morning we're going to have a song of encouragement, a song of invitation. So let let me tell you something. I know some of you are struggling, and I don't mean to beat you up this time of year, and, and I'm not. I know this can be a difficult time, a time where you're not feeling the joy. So let let me tell you this. Um, If you ever want to come and talk, I'm available. My phone number, my email address is in the bulletin. Um, if, If life hurts, I'm here to listen. I want to help you anytime. Because for many of us, this is a joyful time. For many of us, it's a very sad and hurtful times. I understand. We're here for you. We want to help you. To our guests, thank you for being here. You have our bulletin. Hopefully you do. Um, Make sure you get one. It has our phone numbers, the elders, myself. You can call us, text us, um, email us. We're your church while you're down here. We hope you enjoy your stay on the Emerald Coast. And uh, we want to help you while you're down here any way that we can. If anyone here today has the need of the invitation, you're welcome to publicly respond this morning. 
If you don't want to publicly respond, get with me afterwards, one of the elders. Uh, that's okay too. But we'll give you that opportunity right now. Let us stand. Let us sing.